that's built to allow that to be possible. So, we, we jumped through a few, few slides here. I'll just show you a few other pictures of how we applied this. This is measuring the freshness of fruit. But before I go further, were there any questions at this point? Somebody said, we didn't have time for Q&A. Well, if you think it's fine, yes. <laughs> so this is an example of measuring the freshness of fruit using this principle. So what we're doing is <clears throat> we're testing how fresh that fruit is by sensing the quality of its dielectric. Basically, how we get, you know how we learned how to do this? Uh, I'll this, I'll just tell you a little story. So we're there in Australia, and Rob Gourlay has just finished writing a paper and is actually making serious money there in Australia, uh, locating what's called primary water. Anybody know what's primary water is sometimes called deep rock water. It's, it's not the local water table. Primary, if you get down to primary water you, and you find it in the desert and it's available globally, you can bloom the desert. And there's people that are very good at finding primary water. And they, a lot of them believe that the earth made that water, not biology. But that's another long story. So primary water is like the holy grail of dowsing, right? So we're wandering around the Australian, around Canberra, and uh, Rob relating here. And he's built a device to measure where is the deep rock water, right? And you know what it was? You take capacitor A and capacitor B, they're just condensers, just the same thing that Paul showed you. There's a little uh, condenser that's ringing like a bell at a certain frequency. And then you measure extremely accurately how well capacitor A is coupled to capacitor B. That's it. So if capacitor A is ringing over here, capacitor B is over here, you, you can measure very uh, efficiently how much of the energy from this one is getting over here you know, within the microvolt or something. So it's very slight difference in charge, distribution, efficiency. That's my new bumper sticker, charge, distribution, efficiency. So you measure a slight change in charge, distribution, efficiency. You can tell where God is. I mean, no, you can tell where the primary water is, right? So we're walking down, sure enough. It's like practically the ultimate dousing tool, right? So we're measuring and effectively doing that, measuring how well this ringing capacitor couples with this one. It's called capacitive mm -hmm. coupling. You know how, how many people here know about the Princeton Newosphere project where they measured on 9-11? Uh, uh, sure enough, uh, the collective mind caused their random number generator to go nuts, yeah. right? Yeah. And if you ask the physicists at the Princeton Newosphere project who are convinced that the collective unconscious is steering their device, you say, how does it work? They say, well, well we, got us a, we got us a Josephson junction over there and we, it's magic. That's what physicists say, it's magic. That's their word. Yeah. But if you ask me, I say it's capacitive coupling. I say that Josephson junction is just a fancy capacitor, and the ringing of that capacitor gets more efficient when there's charge compression, and the atmosphere gets fractal. Very simple. For the same reason that rainbows show up when Tibetans die, because you've got this nice compression going on. So is this measurable between people? Well, if you look at the Princeton Newosphere project. There's a... Decades now, they've been documenting major global psychological events, and the random number of generators go nuts. Mm -hmm. And the key operative element is the Josephson junction, and that, I say, is a capacitive coupler. Mm -hmm. Okay, so it's doing the same thing we were doing when we were walking over the primary water and looking for the voice of God. <laughs> it's measuring what area is the resonance connected between. Now, the Hopi burial ground and all the, the, the dolmen are at Dodeki Kosa grids, they can capacitive couple. Okay. So that you get the idea of what we're talking about here is this charge connection. And finally, of this section. Well, yeah, so we're talking about the dielectric being faster than light being the mechanism of gravity waves. And the next slide is about gravity waves, the longitudinal. And longitudinal is able to reach into the nucleus. Remember, this is what's coming from the therophyte, is longitudinal wave. So it's bioactive. Tom Bearden spent, again, half his life on why longitudinal waves are bioactive and superluminal, right? And the mechanism of the most far-reaching biologic communication, mitogenic radiation, another name for DNA radio, okay? The frequencies of DNA radio, and spiritual energy, okay? So now I wanted to show an example. These were my friends, actually. This is Hodewanik and Ramsey. I actually introduced Bill Ramsey, the electrical engineer, 
to, uh, who's that guy in Hawaii that does the, what can his name? Uh, no, no. Uh, yeah, Marco Rodin. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. yeah, yeah. Marco. Uh, so Marco Rodin, I was to, Marco is a sweet guy, but he's an artist, and he wouldn't know electrical engineering if it bit him in the nose. I really love him. But you really need some engineering to understand. How, so I introduced him to Bill Ramsey, and Bill Ramsey did this work with Greg Hodewanek, who was measuring gravity waves. Now, the government had just funded Weber like half a billion dollars to try to measure a gravity wave, and they're using this lithosphere. So, the lithosphere is in the headlines about every day. Look it up for measuring gravity waves. Physicists would like to know what's a gravity wave. Well, hello, what's coming out of Therify? Let's check this out. So, instead of the half a billion dollar gadget that uh, <clears throat> Weber had just really in measuring the lithosphere and the, the gravity waves, uh, Bill Ramsey and Greg Hodewanek took a 25 cent capacitor <laughs> mounted in what's called a rust track recorder, which is just recording the output of the capacitance, and they measured. And when the supernova hit, okay, they're just, just watching the capacitor vibrate and checking when there's major gravitational alignments, supernova, major planetary alignments. Okay, this is the explosion of a star and the output of a 25 cent capacitor. So I think, uh, you know, Weber had uh, kind of wasted the government's money there. And, and, this, and they measured the shock wave front and the accretion ring and the average gravity. I mean, you, you got to look up this work. I'm not gonna, we can't go into the whole thing. But the shtick is, here's the other part of this fun story. In terms of gravity waves, they have dozens of these charts that show up that prove the major, like, uh, star explosions that take X number of years to arrive in the telescope <laughs> in the capacitor. No, 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 that star explosion wanders over a lot faster than the speed of light every time. Now, there's lots of documentation on that. But, and again, we're not going to do the whole story, but look up Hodewanek and Ramsey if you're interested. But suddenly here is a little capacitor measuring this dielectric coupled, capacitive coupled gravity wave. <clears throat> and how did that get launched? Longitudinal electromagnetics. So, what is the gravity? The gravity, the gravity is what physicists call it. The gravity is the charge acceleration towards center caused centripetally by fractal phase conjugation. That's what we say it is. And so in that sense, I'm saying that the mechanism of gravity is the same longitudinal waves. Now, um, I, I, think it's, I think it's okay to say this. I'm working with, uh, I think it should be public. Uh, I'm working with a, a, one of the world's most famous and controversial uh, scientists. Uh, his name is Carl Schwartz. And he's a wonderful guy. And he escaped the US because the federal judge died just the day before the US government was going to steal his technology from him, which they do all the time. <laughs> it's their banana republic trip. And his technology is to make carbon nanomaterial carbon nanomaterial is like this. And, and the carbon nanomaterial uh, is, he can make it 90%, 90-95% pure by the ton. And of course, this is going to make half the industry on the planet obsolete, starting with Airbus and energy and 32 times stronger than steel. And oh, by the way, it's a phase conjugator. So his propulsion device was out of the solar system in days and not years, like NASA's. I mean, it's, this is just, and the story is a lot more fun than the movie uh, uh, Chain Reaction. A lot more fun. But anyway, so how did he make that propulsion, these gravity waves? Well, if you contain this resonance in such a way that the compression turns into acceleration and make that one direction, or there's this famous microwave gravity device, I don't know if you've seen the pictures. So, Obviously, those physics stories are a bit too advanced for our little 10 minutes here. But let me give you a practical example. Let's, let's take an example that's very close to home. We're working on all these projects for gravity waves. I refer you to fractalfield.com slash propulsion. And we have this Kosky Frost crystal propulsion, and we have this hydro hydraulic propulsion. But I'm going to give you a way to think about this that you might be able to take home with you. Here's the way to think about it. We can prove, uh, among Karatkov's and other measures, that after death, you are a plasma cloud. We know how many minutes it takes it to leave your body. 
We know where it goes after death, and we know why. We know a lot about what happens to you after death as a plasma cloud. It's all electrical engineering. It's cool stuff. We know why the presence of a ghost causes the spot to get colder. Right? That's how you Ghostbusters find them. Now you, for the first time, know why. Do you know why that plasma cloud called a ghost got the spot colder? You get it, right? We just finished that conversation, right? So we know a lot about what you are after death. And my question to you is, how do you navigate? Anybody here care? Does it matter? Mm -hmm. I think it might. Yeah. How do you navigate when you're a lucid dream? How, do you, how are you, you going to steer that? No little tornado. <laughs> um, actually, I think I, I, I forgot the right toy, my seven-color donut. But imagine I have my seven-color donut model, which you've all seen, which I seem to, I don't know where it is right now. Uh, but basically, a plasma cloud is a torus, right? If you put a, a, a golden spiral on that torus and animate its rotations, Everybody here has seen those, and we, I guess we could have a few of them for fun. But we're talking about after-death navigation in context here. This is today's conversation about key, and the animations are... Okay, here's, yes, okay. Seven-color donut model. Yeah, well, that's, that, so that's the torus. This is about the physics of color, which we want to get to later. <coughs> this is too many movies, too little time. Oh, well, we have some animations. Look at this. Okay. If we come at this one from the beginning. Choosy confusion. Careful. It's okay. Everything's fine. PowerPoint can't do that. I need to find a way to turn off the sound. <coughs> it's weird. It's Escape. Escape. Audio. Oh. It's weird. <laughs> uh, so when you put the seven color donut model generated by that golden spiral on the tetra, <laughs> this you get Alice Bate Gimel Dow, right? So basically you're just indexing the tilt of those donuts. And when you visualize the alphabet correctly, you're controlling the tilt angle. I'm yeah, sorry about that. I haven't, I haven't run uh, Keynote through the, the HDMI cable before. I need to, it's a new computer and a new projector, and there's a few parts of the toys that the kids haven't figured out. <laughs> but anyway, the, we're, remember, we're talking about how you navigate, right? This is a navigation problem. So if, if you're a... Um, an astronaut, and you need to navigate your space capsule. You get your coordinates around you very accurately. Know which way to shoot your jet, to, to you know, to be the Jetsons, to shoot your shoot your jets. <laughs> so choosing the angle at which you shoot your jets is your only option for navigating if you're an astronaut, basically. And the vector set, the vector coordinate system that allows you to keep a reference set, is a tetracubic lattice structure which allows you to index what angle to shoot your jets. So the only thing, and you know that your mind in your optical cortex is a magnetic donut. That's what you are. That's why Ophain and Minokian and uh, Kabbalistic uh, letter forms can cast a spell, because you tilt the donuts, you cause them to implode, and you blow the doors off the church. It changes the air pressure in the room, and you understand the physics. It's real. And uh, Teresa, hopefully, will talk about that tonight, actually, the Ophane Minokia. And they do it from the four directions. So you're controlling the tilt angle of donuts, called the sacred alphabets. And now, so you, now you know what the navigation system is. The only thing you need to learn is why the angle of that spiral on that donut causes propulsion. Right? You got the vector set figured out. You know you're a donut, and after you die, you're a donut. It's called plasma. All plasma is toroidal fundamentally, especially ball lightning, which is what you might be if you're good. So you got to steer. <clears throat> How do you steer? The same way you cast a spell, the same way the rabbi makes a golden, right? You got to take those index of the magnetic donuts and you got to sequence them right. So you got, the, you got the flavor of this. The only thing you didn't figure out was that there's a particular reason why the golden spiral 
on the magnetic donut turns compression into acceleration. Oh, wait. We just had that conversation. Oh. That's how you make propulsion. That's how you steer tornadoes. <laughs> uh, a break. A break. Thank you. Maybe 15 minutes we take a pause and